slow slide. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. well, also, too, uh, back-end server calls on the same network are obviously going to be much quicker, too, than back-end calls that are going to different, you know, servers around the web. So that would be another thing, too. So these language-specific modules will also help a lot if you're trying to create a malicious client and um, do things like that. Uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, popular languages like PHP, uh, Python, Perl, and others as well. And I decided to put a couple examples in the, the presentation you can click on later to kind of mess around with, because um, I'm talking about it kind of almost from an abstract perspective. Like I've talked about APIs, but I haven't shown what any of this looks like. So hopefully I'm not getting too many glassy eyes. I don't think so, but um, so there's a couple for you know some popular websites. When you're going through the documentation or whether you're using a zero-knowledge perspective, um, you might notice when you, when you light off your web browser and you load something up and you're, you're inspecting everything that's going on with an inspection proxy, you might see tons of calls everywhere. Um, so you, you'd really have to pick and choose which ones are kind of calling APIs or which ones are calling functionality that you weren't aware of. Um, you're you're going to want to not only determine the depth of the API into the application, but, but also um, you know, what functionality is available to the API that aren't available to your quote-unquote standard users? And, and usually those are, are for, you know, require elevated privileges. So those are going to be interesting. Also, is there any segregation between the API calls and the ap actual application itself? Because that would definitely cause a problem. Now, if, you're, if your API and, and your application are one and the same, basically, and you're integrating content, um, now all of the content that you're integrating into your application is now rendering on the same canvas if it's a web application, which can be very bad, as we'll see later. And basically what I just said. How is your content integrated? Is it integrated into the same domain? Is it rendered on the same canvas? Um, are you creating multiple pathways to similar functionality? And where that becomes a problem is when it comes to fix time. So if you find a bug in something and you fix it in one spot, now you need to fix it in multiple spots. Uh, which often gets forgotten about. So you may have a bug that you identified a year ago that's still available through your API that because of, uh, in, in bugs, not only from a, a coding perspective, but from a session management and authorization perspective. So you may be providing standard users with elevated functionality in, through an application and uh, through the standard interface that you developed, they don't have that functionality. What is the structure of the call? Like, what, is, what does it accept? Um, what types of data formats are you dealing with? So once you understand that, it makes it a lot easier to understand how to violate it. So obviously, if you're using, like, SOAP, um, you know that there's supposed to be a standardized envelope. And if you, if you mess with that too much, um, you know what, should ex what you should expect to happen. But you can do all the same web application attacks against API calls that you can against standard applications. So if you're talking about trying to do some some, you know, some things with JSON or XML, you know, th those are defined formats and, you know, if you can uh, violate those, then it's win. And also the type of transport. So what type of service are you dealing with when you're sending data back and forth? So here's a, a simple, simple API call. Um, and this is uh, one that I did a while back when I was messing with uh, Google a little bit. So uh, there are a few things that you should notice about this and hopefully it's big enough for everybody to read. One is you should see it appears to be a standard HTTP GET. So that should be pretty obvious. So this whole thing is contained in, in, a, in a GET request. Um, the other obvious thing that would be interesting if you were um, testing is you should see that it's a call from one domain to a completely different domain. So it appears to be pulling content through something called a proxy, which should be something else that would be interesting. Uh, and it appears to be retrieving that content. Um, you'll also know that it, where it says open social underscore URL, you, you'll also notice that somebody thought about um, content encoding on that. So it's, uh, it's um, URL encoded. And um, it appears to be signed with a token. Uh, but that doesn't mean anything because uh, even though it says auth type equals signed and there's a token, um, this was something that got horribly violated during a different talk in 2008 that we gave at, uh, that um, me and Sean Moyer, 
purposely pronouncing his last name wrong because he used to do it to me all the time. Me and Sean Moyer did at uh, Black Hat 2008. So that's what, uh, and, and throughout the rest of the talk, I'm going to use a, like simple examples of, you know, just a standard get to show how these things are violated. But it could be in any format. So here's an example for delicious. Um, can anybody tell me what type of web service this is? From looking at it? There you go. If I had a prize, I would give it to you. It's a, it's a RESTful web service. Because it's using all of, the, all of the methods. It's using get, post, put, and delete. So, and, and just from looking at this, this should be interesting, is that uh, it, it doesn't say anything about authentication, like in just what I showed you. It doesn't say anything about authentication and session management. So if you just, you know, decided to post out to add a bookmark to quote unquote username, um, you know, what would happen? And those are the types of things that you want to be thinking about when you're testing. Is anything that seems to be static in nature, especially, anything static should be attacked. It should be violated. The structure should be analyzed. Um, uh, uh, not, well, I'll get into that when I get into the fat client stuff. And of course, bolting on, which is popular with people who have had applications out there for a long time and now need to provide some sort of functionality. Even if it's not for external consumption, even if it's only for internal consumption, you know, um, bolting on APIs can, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's just the thought process and the design needs to be there because fixes are often not integrated and you're once again creating, potentially creating multiple paths to the same functionality. Uh, what I've seen happen quite often is the wrapping of services. So you might not want to create your own instant messaging framework or chat framework uh, within your application. So you may look elsewhere for, for services that provide that, and then you might want to wrap it in your client. Well, that's all well and good, but when you're wrapping something, uh, you need to be aware of all of the functionality that's available. And from a tester, that's that's... Um, great because usually these other services are very well documented. Uh, a simple example would be, you know, I have a site and I want to create a chat framework and instant message framework, but I don't want to write the back-end code. So maybe I'll wrap Jabber uh, up in my front end. Um, but Jabber has some interesting things by nature because it's open. So if you weren't aware that you can just register as a new user by just, you know, registering on the Jabber service, that could be a huge problem. Because um, now you have extra functionality. Also, think about the fact that maybe you can use your own client to connect to that. And yes, once again, I am standing up here talking about something on Adult Friend Finder. It's just funny to me. But um, that is using iChat to connect to the Adult Friend Finder messaging service um, because it's just Jabber. So they had this intricate front end that was written in Flash that I never did, like, fully take a look at. I just noticed that it was calling Jabber port, so I assumed that it was Jabber. Uh, when I lit up my, I lit up uh, iChat, I directly connected to it, and I found out that the security policy that was pushed, basically, um, the restrictions that were placed on the Flash client were no longer there because I had used my, my, own, uh, my own messenger to connect to that. So those are the types of things to think about when, when testing services that appear to be wrapped or, or um, when you're in the design phase of, of doing, you know, implementation. So identify functions that you definitely don't want your users, you know, taking advantage of and, um, you know, putting in place restrictions properly. So fat client applications. Increasingly lately, we're having more and more fat, fat client applications that are just using HTTP as a transport protocol, which obviously there's nothing wrong with that, but that opens up some things as well. So one of my favorite things is Dropbox. Now I love Dropbox. I use it all the time. Um, I love their new shirt contest, uh, which this was actually on a shirt, and it says it just somehow works, um, which is kind of how sometimes we take everything. It just somehow works. I just know I drop things in this folder, and automatically it gets synced online through some form of magic. Um, but just because it's a... a, a a fat client application doesn't mean there's not client-side functionality that we can't analyze and take a look at, at how it's used. And um, so from that perspective, you may notice if you use Dropbox on OS X, um, you can right-click on files in your Dropbox. And there's a couple of options where it says browse on Dropbox website and view previous versions because there's version control with Dropbox. 